For those of you who joined us, we are here. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the director of our Ed Outreach Program. Um, and today uh, we got a little bit selfish and wanted to talk about uh, California School for the Blinds programs. So we realized that we've been having sessions uh, every week talking about other uh, key programs in our state or uh, opportunities for blind and low vision kids. And we recognize that uh, our own program is a fantastic opportunity for students throughout California. And so we wanted to provide a forum to give more information and um, and knowledge to uh, teachers, parents, and whoever might attend today. So without further ado there, I think we're going to get started. Shannon's going to share a slide deck and we're joined by the rest of our administrative team at CSB. Ah, I see it. It's there. All right. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gina Wallet. I'm the superintendent at the California School for the Blind. And we're going to, I'm going to walk you through these first few slides and then turn it over to the rest of the committee. Uh, Shannon, can you go to the, oh, Shannon, can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so thanks for joining us today. It's exciting, 24 people. Well, 24 including us, so we'll do the math later and find out how many that is. Um, you've all joined us today with our interview, with our admissions review committee to talk about CSB, why, when, how, how do you refer students to CSB? Why would you do so? What do we have to offer? Um, and any questions you have, the process is a little wonky. It's a little lengthy. Some of you have been through it and you may have questions. So this, you have an opportunity at the end to, to ask us any questions you might have about the process or why to refer students or questions about our programs. We're, we're here to answer all of your questions. So we're going to start with introductions. I already introduced myself. Um, I think Let's see if I can do this alphabetically. We'll, the rest of the team can introduce themselves. We'll go Adrian, Angela, Jennifer, and Shannon uh, in that order so we know who's after who. Hi again, you guys, Director of Outreach, Adrian Amandi. Uh, this is, uh, we'll get to a couple slides about outreach at the end, but this is primarily about our on campus programs. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Martin, and I'm Principal of Education at CSB. Look forward to sharing more about our programs with all of you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Simmons. I'm the Director of Student Services and Admissions at CSB. So uh, you're actually going to hear me talking a lot today about our admissions process. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and we're kind of hoping that this will be informal and, and interactive. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shannon Johns, and I am the principal of career and vocational programs here at CSB. I'm excited to be here with you today. All right. Uh, we also have a couple of people here who aren't on the committee of Bay and Winnie. Got to give a shout out to them. They're our support staff here to help us out today. Thank you for being here, Bay and Winnie. Um, so um, what we wanted to start out by asking what brought you here today. And we are curious sort of if you've Maybe you've done a referral before and you have some, you know, you have some feedback or comments, or maybe you've never done a referral, maybe you're not familiar with our program. So if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to unmute yourself and shout out why you're here today, or you can put it in the chat if you'd feel better doing that. That's fine too. We just wanted to get a sense of what brought you here today, and that'll help us maybe tailor a little bit to we'll have time for QA at the end, but we thought that might help us tailor a little bit to, to why you're here today. Hi, I'm Diane. I'm with San Diego Unified. And the reason I'm here is um, because it came up recently. Some one of our staff members was told that um, we should put on the IEP section of the IEP that um, we considered California School for the Blind as far as placement for the student. And I and I'm just curious um, about the program I have sent a, I did have a student there and I do the short courses with my students too whenever they're available. So I want to find out more. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, so there's a section on the IEP. I don't know if your IEP has that. Um, and you just say like you considered general education, you considered um, um, special day class or whatever it is. And then also there's a uh, checkbox for state school or something like that. All right, thank you. Um, a couple of things in the chat in case anybody can't access the chat right now. 
Somebody said gaining information to share with parents. I've never done a referral before. Curious to know how to propose CSB at IEPs as a placement option. Interested in referring a general ed student, or a high school student. Um, involved in referrals in the past as an O&M and wanted to get the latest update um, and how to refer to CSB. So these are all great questions. I think we'll cover most of this today. And if, of, of course, if there's any question we don't get to today, you can always feel free to reach out to us and we'll give you contact information. Great. All right, thanks. So a little, so a little tiny, tiny bit about the history of CSB, just so you know who we are. Believe it or not, CSB has been around since 1860. It's crazy to think we've been around for 160 years, but here we are. Started out in San Francisco as a school for the deaf and blind, and then in the 1920s, separated into a school for the blind and a school for the deaf. Moved to Berkeley, um, and then we've been here in Fremont, in the the Bay Area, since 1980 or so, and we are still, we're right next door to School for the Deaf. We work pretty closely with them um, on certain things. Um, so that's how long we've been around. We are considered what we're called a category as a state special school. So we're not an LEA, we're not an independent schools district, we're not a private school. Um, we're a state special school. We're governed by the California Department of Education along with the two other schools for the deaf. There's one in Fremont, one in Riverside, but we're the only school for the blind. We serve the whole state, all 58 counties belong to us. We, we are happy to serve students from any county in the state. Um, and actually a bit of trivia, if you have an out-of-state student, um, it's a little trickier, but they are eligible under the California Education Code to come to CSB too. Um, but the state had, their state has to pay for it. So a little trivia there for you. Um, and CSB is considered the continuum of services available to any student. And that's a, actually a requirement under IDEA. IDEA requires that states have a continuum of options available to IEP teams. So CSB is just one option on that continuum. And we do serve students whose primary needs are related to their visual impairment. Okay, next slide, please. This slide tells you a little bit about our mission, CSB's mission statement. I'm just gonna read it out to you. Um, the California School for the Blind provides intensive disability educational services to students who have primary learning needs related to their visual impairment. And we will talk a little, little bit about that later on. We talk about who is commonly referred to our school. We'll talk a little bit about primary learning needs. Uh, CSB serves as a statewide resource to provide expertise to local education agencies and families. Uh, we'll talk a tiny bit about outreach because quite a bit of what we do is outreach, but you've probably heard that from Adrian before. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, and evidence-based assessment, specialized curriculum, research technology, and innovative models of instruction that prepare students for adult life. So we'll talk to you a little bit about these programs today. Uh, next slide. One of, one of the core tenets of what we do is really independence and empowerment also for students, um, self-advocacy, self-determination. It's really to provide students with, with the skills that they need to do things for themselves, to reach their full level of potential when it comes to their, their independence um, and leading a, a happy, fulfilling life. So we really don't wanna do things for the students. The step back philosophy is a big part of what we do. Uh, let kids, we're not afraid to let kids fall sort of literally and figuratively um, to, to learn on their own and, and be independent. So, um, and there's a great quote on this screen here, overprotection and low expectations are a roadmap to dependence. And definitely dependence is um, what we really aim to get as far away from as possible for our students. Um, next slide. So just to give you a little overview of our population, we hover around 70 to 80 students. We seems like we often, some years we get all the way up to 85. It's been, I hear it's been decades since, I've been at CSB 15 years, um, but I hear it's been decades since we were at like 100 kids. It seems like sort of 80, 70 to 80 is our sweet spot. Um, we're a little low right now, a little bit below that with 64 students. Um, that's where we're at. Our students do come from all over California, from all the way south, all the way north. Um, east, West, we have students from all over. Uh, I can give you a specific list, actually. I just had to crunch that today, so I can give you a list of all the counties we currently serve, but they are from all over. Usually we have about half and half, roughly, is residential and day. We're a little bit heavier on day students right now. We'll talk about this. Day students are considered students who live within an hour commute of CSB, um, which is a little tri tricky to calculate, but uh, that's sort of our day students or students who can get here in a, a, an hour's time or so, and then residential students or anyone who live outside of that. The average length of attendance is three years, and that really varies. We 
Um, I think the longest student, we have a student who graduated, I don't remember how many years ago she graduated, one of you might remember, she had been here since kindergarten, she'd been here for at CSB, she spent 13 years at CSB um, and graduated, that's really uncommon for a student to have that many years, but we do have kids who come for a year or two to get really intensive instruction and return to district and other students who end up staying um, quite a few more years for, for one reason or another. Um, it really varies on the needs of the student and, and frankly, the family, you know, sometimes families are more comfortable, they end up staying um, and other families are, are also eager to get them back into district with their general ed peers. Uh, our, our student achievement also is a really wide range. Again, a lot of that's related to the referral reasons. We have students that are pretty far below grade level and are working on more of a, um, an applied academic or a life skills curriculum. And then we have students that are above grade level and are, are targeting targeted for, for getting a high school diploma and, and do graduate with one. So that's a pretty wide range of students in our in our little 64 student population. Um, and we have students ages five to 22. We do on the next slide, you'll see the graph of, of the ages, but we do have a pretty um, wide range of students, but certainly more emphasis, more, more uh, heavy on the side of older students. We do get quite a few students who come for transition services. So the, that 18 to 22, well, we'll just go to that slide and then we'll see <laughs> that graph. Um, 28 students in the ninth grade to 12th grade. A good chunk of those are, are students who are involved in our mainstream program that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but some of those students are also non-diploma students. But certainly that sort of age 15 and up is the, the bulk of our students. We have only four students right now, K3. There's some years we only have one or two kids in that range. So we love getting younger kids on our campus. And um, But it's never been a, it's, it's not a large pop part of our population, which is, um, you know, it is what it is. We, we're pretty upfront with parents and families when they refer a student that we don't have a ton of kids in that age range. And I think that's really important to be really transparent with about parent with parents so that they know if they refer a young student, they're not going to have a huge peer group like they would in a general ed school. So we do talk about that um, with families when they, re when, when referrals are made. Um, so that's just sort of in a nutshell, a little overview of, of CSB. I'm going to pass it over to Angela and Shannon to talk about our programs. Actually, sorry, uh, Gina, can we go back yeah. to the previous slide for a moment? I just yeah. wanted to point out Feel that free. the big, um, you know, this graph shows, um, it's a nice visual that shows, um, you know, few, a lot fewer younger students, many more older students, and the big bar for ninth through 12th graders that does include, as, as uh, Gina mentioned, our um, high school students who are, are participating in, in um, gen ed mainstream programs, but that also includes our high school students who are in um, our ACES program, which we'll hear more about from Shannon. So that's why that's such a big group. And then 12 plus are our, our um, students in our adult transition program. And now we'll hear about our programs. All right, so welcome to CSB. If, you, if we were on campus today, as you drive up on Walnut Boulevard, you would see the sign California School for the Blind welcoming you to our campus. Um, and the front of our campus, it's a little hard to see there as well. There's a bus circle and our students can actually take public transportation directly from our campus, which I think is really great. So our programs at CSB, as Gina mentioned already, span the grades, elementary, middle school, high school, and adult transition. And we have classes, um, small class sizes, and teaching assistants available in most classes, but not one-on-one -on -one support. I wanted to mention that we do offer as assistance, but not one-on-one. -on -one. We really are striving for independence and um, setting students up for success in these small environments and allowing them more opportunity to be um, working independently. Next one. So as part of all of our programs available to all students, we have adaptive physical education classes. We have assistive technology team that supports the classrooms. We have a braille program. Um, they're getting braille within the classes, but then we also have an additional braille student, braille teacher that can group students a little bit more by braille levels, not just grade level. 
Um, food preparation and daily living skills is a big emphasis on our campus. We have a library that's um, well stocked with curriculum and um, braille and audio and large print um, options for students. We have a low vision clinic on campus that's run in collaboration with University of California at Berkeley. Um, off campus students are eligible for those low vision exams, as well as our on campus students if they come as a new student to CSB and they haven't had a low vision exam in quite a while, um, we try to offer that as part of our um, initial assessment. Uh, we have a great music program at our school. We offer occupational therapy, orientation and mobility. We have a large team of O&M teachers that are able to provide individual and small group O&M to our, camp, our students. We have, um, psychologists on campus as well that work with assessment needs and also supporting classes on an individual basis. And right now I can say in distance learning, the psychologists are doing a lot of reflections groups with the classes, offering students opportunity as a group to really talk about how they're doing in this time with um, distance learning and being at home. Uh, we have speech and language pathologists that do, again, small group and individual lessons. And then we have work experience, both paid and volunteer. And some of those services are actually directly written into the IEP as a related service. Others are just provided to everyone as part of our general program. So as I said earlier, we aren't able to welcome you to the campus so we tried to build in quite a number of photos in this presentation to give you a sense of what the campus is like. Um, and the elementary group pictured here, there's one young student with a cane. She paused for the picture, but her cane tip is actually stuck in a crack, I think. Uh, anyway, she's out in front of the library. Um, and that's an example of how our students are encouraged to uh, travel on campus independently and learn routes at, at no matter what age. Um, the picture on the right is two elementary students. And in the background, there's uh, the busy elementary classroom. There's computers in the, in the photo, um, a tactile schedule on the wall that students can refer to, um, braille calendars, a variety of things. Um, and yes, I see in the chat, our physical campus is closed right now. Um, we've been closed since March 13th. So everything that we're doing currently is virtual and these pictures are representative um, of things that occurred mostly in 2019 and early 2020 fall. Um, last winter, we had a winter concert. Um, and the picture here is represents a group of CSB students singing at that winter concert. And it's a variety of ages and they're in, the, in our theater. Um, since the winter 2019, we have been, done a couple of virtual concerts. And I did wanna to mention to all of you, if you're ever interested in joining us, um, we, the YouTube channel has some of our old concerts up and uh, we have a spring concert coming May 13th. So that might be an opportunity for you to see some of our students in action and music. In addition to the singing groups, we have a couple of, we, we do instrumental music as well. And we have a couple of different bands uh, that students participate in. And some of those bands even do um, performances off campus in the community. Our art program as well is um, really wonderful program. And every uh, ceramics are big on our campus when we're in person. And I wanted to highlight this one um, because one of our students uh, created some uh, ceramic uh, animals that she built in the art class. And she cre created two different animals. I think it's a mouse and a squirrel. Uh, and she calls it woodland creatures. Um, the squirrel looks like he has a little uh, sword in his hand and they're both wearing red capes, superheroes, I guess. Um, and 
these were um, chosen to be included in the APH calendar for 2022. So our art teacher does a nice job of making sure our student artwork is um, submitted to APH annually for their contests. And we're lucky enough to have some of our student work featured in the upcoming calendar. Um, our Braille program, in this picture, it actually shows our teacher that retired just a few years ago. But what is pictured here is an event we called the Braille Bee. And students compete on um, sort of knowledge of Braille contractions and ability to um, implement the rules of UEB. Um, and in the photo, there's a student reading his card on the table. Another student's holding a microphone and the teacher's holding a stack of cards while other students look on. And if they get it correct, they stay in. And if they don't get it correct, they go sit down in the audience. <laughs> so it really is a like a run like a braille or like a spelling bee, I should say. And I think in the next picture is another just overall, there, you know, there's trophies in the foreground that the students are competing for. And they're encouraging one another, they're clapping for each other, cheering each other on. Um, it's really been a fun event in the past and a way to really get students to review their UEB uh, code too. Um, and then Adriana, this one is for technology integration in the classroom, if you wanna take over for a little bit. Yeah, of course, thank you, Angela. Uh, just to build upon all those amazing things that so, it, you know, as a parent myself, it sounds like you're just describing a school. Um, and that's one of the magical things about coming to CSB and getting to see the kids hang out and be in class and take advantage of these opportunities is suddenly somehow our blind kids and low vision kids are just at school. They're no longer the, the kid on the sidelines. They're no longer the kid that's trying to fit in or figure it out. And they come and they find themselves and they find themselves by having access to all of those things Angela just went over and it's it's exciting and it's fun. And um, as an administrator on the outside edges who gets to meet the kids, but not necessarily worry about all their immediate progress day to day, I get to see kids who come into our school and then I get to watch them grow and I get to meet them down the line. Um, and sadly, I think a lot of the kids who come to CSB don't know themselves. Uh, when they come to our program. They haven't had that opportunity to find their true self. Um, in that and recognizing that and how to run a great program that lets all these fun things happen is a lot of technology. Uh, all of you deal with that in your districts and trying to find the budgets to purchase it. Uh, we are blessed to not only have the ability to have all of those tools on campus, but we also have the ability to support all of those tools in the field. So even if you're not sending your kid to the school for the blind our outreach team can still talk to you about tech but our kids have have all of those options that we talk about in outreach available at their fingertips and one of the most beautiful things that we can integrate with tech is that ability to trial and test machines and in, in different devices and make sure that they have just that right tool and we're not we're not worried about making the braille note the kid fit to the braille note anymore or the kid work with the iPad. We're really able to analyze um, the students' needs themselves and then bring to the table the technology tools that help in each individual lesson and create a system that challenges kids to use multiple tools in their toolbox and multiple pieces in the, of technology throughout their school day. We also have a whole bunch of low vision devices. Is this still on me, Angela? is this, we have a lot of low vision devices that couple and go along with uh, those other tech things. So everything from braille to low vision support, we are able to support our kids on a very individual level. Um, and uh, some of you have seen that we have a bit of a lending library that we've started. It's not everything. And uh, to be quite frank and honest, it wasn't directed at outreach. Uh, it's because if we are going to have a premier program on campus and have all the right tools on campus, we're going to have to have a little bit of an extra inventory uh, to make sure that our kids have access to just the right device for them. Um, rather than letting it sit on a shelf, we now share those items and want to make sure they're benefiting kids throughout uh, California if we, if we are able to. Um, but low vision devices get help from our low vision clinic and classroom uh, teacher specialist, Vanessa Herndon. 
um, and we're able to supply help to our teacher, our classroom teachers and other service providers for the low vision needs of our kids. Great, thank you, Adrian. So then we have a group of students on our campus that actually attend gen ed courses and special ed courses at mainstream schools locally. So we have a collaboration with Fremont Unified for their um, middle school program. Um, seventh and eighth primarily is what we've been doing. Uh, we haven't actually started the sixth graders at Walters yet in part due to um, distance learning, but that will come hopefully in the future. And then Fremont Unified, we have a high school that we mainstream to that's specifically gen ed. Um, it's a four by four block schedule. So it's a quick pace and the students are um, working toward high school diploma in those in at Kennedy High School in Fremont. And then we also have an agreement with Newark Unified at Newark Memorial High School. That program, we're able to um, put place students in gen ed and or special ed courses, depending on their academic needs. And again, they're working toward high school diploma with both of those programs. So the common core classes that they take at the high school couple with our physical education, vision resource, art, music, and assistive technology. They take our transcript and combine it with their mainstream transcript at those local high schools. And then each of those high schools, Kennedy or Newark, will provide the diploma to the student. That's one of the ways we do um, high school diplomas. We also, over the years, I should mention, collaborate with local school districts that refer students. So if you have a student that's very close to graduation and maybe they just haven't finished all their physical education or they need some more elective units, we're able to work with your districts to provide diploma from their home school while they're still attending, say our adult transition or getting more mobility or getting into some of the programs Shannon's gonna be um, highlighting next. That, that's another option. Um, it doesn't, it, it's very individualized. All of our students have an IEP. All of the ways that we're working to tailor the program have to do with their individual needs. Once a student receives a high school diploma though, they are no longer eligible to attend CSB. We're part of the special ed continuum. We can go through age 22, but once they get that diploma, they can't come to our adult programs. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we also have had students attend the Ohlone Community College um, just to take a class and get used to working with um, the support services there while they still have um, O&M and TBI support from CSB as well. So Shannon, I think you're up for the on. All right. Okay, so as Gina and um, Jennifer pointed out at the beginning, we do have a lot of students who um, come to the school for their uh, transition programs. And um, a lot of our students are in a program, this is our ACEs program that I'm gonna talk about now. Um, primarily these are high school and adult students up to age 22. And these students, uh, most of these students are earning their certificate of completion. So the teachers in this program came up with this acronym with the A standing for applied academics, C for college and career, E for the expanded core curriculum, and the S is life skills. So they focus on the S there and life skills. So as the acronym, as the ACEs acronym points out, students in this program are really focused on functional academic skills and of course working on their technology skills as well. We also work on um, independent living skills, such as cooking, orientation and mobility, budgeting, um, et cetera. Um, and then some of the students that are part of our residential program can then become part of our apartment living program. They apply to become part of that program. And we have apartments um, on campus that are located near our dorms. Um, where the students um, are able to live either on their own or with a roommate. 
um, and they receive counselor support in the evenings. And they work throughout the week um, on things like meal planning. They go to the grocery store and buy the ingredients they need. They do cooking activities together. They do those cooking activities maybe independently or with support of the counselor. Um, they also have group cooking lessons where one of the, the vocational teachers who's um, kind of oversees the apartment living program comes and does group cooking activities with everyone as well. Uh, the students work on doing their laundry. They clean up the apartment at the end of the week before they go home. Um, and then as a group, they do special um, group outings and have social events um, as well. So it's a great way for students to work on those independent living skills. We also focus on vocational skills in this program and um, our VOC team um, members work closely with teachers and students to be sure we provide um, various work um, activities throughout their time at CSB. So we focus on soft skills such as job exploration, um, resume, personal data sheet development, interview techniques, uh, time management, appropriate work behavior, self-advocacy, and then they also have opportunities to have many different types of work experience. So those um, work experience opportunities are on campus and off campus. Um, on campus, we have um, a, in con a convenience store and coffee shop called the Rocket Shop where many students work. Um, in the Rocket Shop, they have the opportunity to work as a cashier, to stock shelves, to do some cleaning, to work on their customer service skills. Um, some of them prepare meals that then or prepare food items that staff can buy um, at lunchtime. They also participate in gardening activities on, on campus. There's office tasks like shredding um, and some different entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, I have a hard time with that word, uh, activities such as um, they were making some adapted coloring books and scented crayons um, that they were then able to sell. Uh, so there's lots of uh, work opportunities on campus. And then off campus, we have different work sites. Some of them are paid um, and some are volunteer opportunities. We have a TPP contract with um, the Department of Rehabilitation that allows us to provide the paid work for many of our students. Um, and we have jobs, for example, at Roundtable nearby, um, at a local thrift store. There's also an animal sanctuary where students can work with animals and kind of have a farm experience, um, as well as working with um, one of the local regional parks and cleaning up the visitor center and helping out there. And then we you know, really try to provide help to students as they're getting ready to transition to life beyond CSB, helping them develop their transition portfolio, and then working really closely with the Department of Rehabilitation and with the Regional Center uh, to help students figure out their next steps. I have a few photos here. This, um, this photo shows a couple of our students who were in the apartment living program standing outside of their apartments um, on our campus. Got the student in front, it's a big smile on his face and two thumbs up. Um, they're happy to be there um, and outside their apartment building. We have um, these, this next picture shows one student taking a picture of two other students who are all dressed up for prom. Um, one, the, the young man's wearing a suit and tie and the young lady has a very bright pink dress on. Um, and so we do have opportunities like our prom every year and um, the students are very excited about. And then this picture is taken at a local lake. We show, see some six students out on three different pedal boats um, out on the lake pedaling around, uh, big smiles on their faces. And so this is an opportunity I think they had through their adaptive PE class, um, but we also have various outings um, and opportunities to get out into the community. Another slide here just about our residential services and activities. Um, and as Gina mentioned, um, there are some um, eligibility requirements to be part of the residential program, but um, the residential program does offer various enrichment activities and clubs and um, they put on social events and they're actually doing a lot of that for our students now um, via Zoom um, in the evenings and even mornings before school. Um, they have field trips, there's lots of sport opportunities uh, goal ball and swimming, strength and conditioning, beat ball, track, wrestling, karate, and even a conflict resolution group. 
So lots of opportunities um, for uh, activities outside of school. Um, there's also, you know, I talked about the apartment living program. There's a program called the Bridge Program, which helps um, students in the dorms um, develop the skills they need to be able to be ready to move into the apartment living program as well. I think I said earlier, I said that our school makes this atmosphere that feels just like a regular school, but any of you find a school that offers all of these different outcomes and products and my family will move to that city. Like what we can do with a limited number of kids and this maximized number of staff that really hit the different elements and specificities of need is incredible. And these are, these are some of the things that we do and um, we, we make sure our kids get involved too. It's not, it's not a question of this is an opportunity. It's a, it's a question of which opportunity are you excited about if you're a student in our programs. Just before Jennifer jumps in, I also wanted to say that I think I really enjoy seeing our students build their confidence by trying these different things and really getting out there. I just met with a family last week and that was, they talked about how nurturing our environment is and how much their particular child has grown in their confidence by being at CSB. Okay, so um, thank you for listening to lots of us gush about our school. We're really, um, so it's, it's wonderful to talk about our students and our programs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about if you are, we're listening to all of that and you had a student in mind and you thought, um, oh gosh, you know, well, great, sign me up. I want my student to go. Uh, let's talk about some of the particulars. So why would you refer a student to CSB? Uh, this slide has a picture of one of our elementary school students on it and she um, is, um, using a, uh, she's got a, a sand tray and she's, and there's objects uh, embedded in the sand that she is searching for. Okay, next slide. Sorry, I, I was pressing the button as if I could advance them and I can't. Okay. Um, so when we, when, uh, when we accept applications, we have um, both the school district and the parent will fill out an application and one of the portions of the application they will indicate um, there's um, a place where they can rank order um, reasons for referral. And so I went through all of the applications that we received for this current school year um, and these were the top five reasons for referral on the district application and the parent application. So you can see a lot of overlap uh, for both the district and the parent. Top reason for referral uh, is to access vision services. Um, sounds pretty obvious. Um, school district also, uh, the, the second uh, most popular reason on the district application was orientation mobility. Um, Third, for both parent and school district, we see functional skills. Um, and also I noticed that there is a, uh, this is the, this is the, these are the top five reasons for all of the referrals. As the students, uh, as the, the, the applicants get older, more often sort of a runner up that doesn't appear on this list was transition services. And often if a, parent or a district was indicating functional skills as a reason for a referral, they often paired that with transition services for an older student who they were specifically looking at our adult transition program for. Um, Braille, number four on both lists. Um, and for the school district, making the top five list uh, would be adaptive equipment or assistive technology. Um, always interesting to know that um, parents, not surprisingly, number two, um, are prioritizing academic achievement for their students. Um, so uh, interesting to see the top uh, five reasons for referral. And um, so, you know, we often get uh, TVIs calling up, um, discussing their particular student, um, wondering if their student might be a fit for our program. So I'm just going to take a little while to sort of look at uh, the whole concept of, you know, who we, we earlier, Gina shared with us some of the, the stats, numbers of students, grade levels, that kind of thing. Who really are our students? Um, 
we tend to serve students who require intensive services related to their visual impairment. Um, uh, these would be services where the local team has determined that um, they're not able to, to adequately address the vision needs. Maybe um, it's a student in a very rural area with limited services. Um, or it may be that the student has um, been in the district and has accessed the local resources and those resources have kind of been exhausted. Um, and so the team is looking for what, you know, what is the next step for this student. Um, we often will see students who are moving from print to braille. Maybe they, maybe their vision sadly has deteriorated to the point where they're no longer able to access print and they're needing to need to learn braille. Um, a student might come to us under those circumstances. Um, students, and that would also include students who have a dramatic change in visual functioning, um, where the team, the IEP team is determining that a very sort of intense focus. You remember Gina saying that our average uh, length, of, length of enrollment for students is about three years. It might be a team who is looking to have a student come for an intense focus on vision services, on learning tech, on learning Braille, with the goal to ultimately return to district or um, to, to a more of a gen ed program once they've uh, really brushed up on their vision specific skills and their ECC. Um, earlier, um, Kim asked a question in the chat about do we serve students with multiple disabilities? And yes, we do. In fact, um, uh, right now I crunch the numbers, 55% of our currently enrolled students have a disability in addition to visual impairment. Um, we only have about 28 students, I think, who are uh, their IEPs, they are, are uh, their primary disability is vision and they do not have a secondary disability. So we do serve students who have uh, complex, complex learning needs. Um, and as you heard Shannon and other folks mentioning, students in need of an adult transition program that has a VI emphasis is another group of students that, um, that we serve for sure. Um, this is a fine print. Um, I love that somebody highlighted it because they cut to the chase. Um, these, are our, uh, these are our eligibility criteria and they're actually pretty short even though the print is small and you can find this word for word on our website. Essentially, any student who has a visual impairment is going to be essentially eligible to apply for, for our program. Um, and I'm just going to just jump to the highlights so you can see really how straightforward it, this is. Um, applicants, we will consider an applicant if they can benefit educationally um, from by showing the following criteria. And one is that their primary educational needs are related to a severe sensory loss, which in most cases is going to be vision. We, we do take applications for students who are deaf blind. Um, we look at those on an individual case by case basis. I will often get a call, someone will say, well, do I apply to the school for the deaf or do I apply to the school for the blind? And that really comes down to who is the student? How do they communicate? How do they learn? Um, what senses do they use to access information? And yeah, it's not a it's not a cut and dried answer. It really comes down to looking at the individual student's needs. Um, so the primary educational needs need to be related to a severe sensory loss in um, vision. It's got to be in there. Um, they need to be able to benefit from disability specific instruction. They need to be able to learn simple mobility patterns and routes. So this is looping us back to what Gina was talking to us about in the beginning with the emphasis on independence. And they need to be able to access the general education or alternative curriculum with reasonable accommodations on our campus that don't result in a fundamental alteration of our program. And that loops us back to what Angela was saying about one-on-one. -on -one. Um, do not be fearful if your student currently has a one-to-one -one assistant. That's that we we receive a lot of applications for students who currently have a one-to-one -one assigned because their one-to-one -one is serving the role of helping them access, um, um, you know, a busy comprehensive campus. Um, or uh, the one-to-one -one has the job of adapting the materials from the teacher, you know, transcribing those materials, embossing, um, making audio recordings, that kind of thing. Um, 
we have many, many, many students apply to our campus with one-on-one -on -one who make a successful transition of not needing that one-to-one -one support once they come to our campus because the campus is set up to address vision, vision needs. Um, so so um, just coming to our campus and receiving the O&M, receiving all of the ECC instruction, focus on independence, um, the ability to fade out that one-to-one -one, in most cases ver goes very smoothly. If it is, if a, if it's a student who can will continue to need one-to-one -one, um, for for learning needs beyond the vision, um, in order to help them focus uh, for a behavioral need, in order to adapt the curriculum um, to their level so that they can access it. Those kinds of things um, would likely be if, the, if a student absolutely needed to continue with the one-to-one -one aid in order to access instruction, they would not meet our eligibility criteria. The exception to that would be a deafblind student who needed the services of an intervener. Uh, which we see as a, a different role than than one to one an intervener who is facilitating communication between the student and their peers and the student and their teachers um, serves a different role. That first slide, that was the fine print for our day program. So everybody's got to meet the eligibility criteria for a day program. And then if it's a student who's, who wants to access the residential program, there are a couple of additional criteria. Um, you've heard a couple people say that to access the residential program is really uh, based on, on geography. And it's not about miles because as you probably know in the San Francisco Bay Area, the miles can be kind of, can look very reasonable, but the time on the road can exceed a whole hour. So we're really looking at the time of the commute. If the student, if it's gonna take the student um, more than 60 minutes one way to get to our school each day, then they are eligible to apply for our residential program. And then to the additional criteria for residential program really has to do with safety. Can the student respond independently and appropriately in a life-threatening situation? Not that they would be left alone in a life-threatening situation, but in an emergency situation, students really need to be able to have the wherewithal to recognize that it's an emergency and be able to move on their own speed out of the building. Again, not that there wouldn't be staff on hand to assist them, but in worst case scenario, can students evacuate the building on their own? Um, the other issue is um, behavior that doesn't pose a threat to themselves or others. Um, if if and, and I should say that students who maybe apply to our program and are find, found not to meet our eligibility criteria, um, are welcome to reapply. And we do have students who applied maybe at a younger age and did not, and, and enrollment was not recommended or offered, but went back to district, reapplied at an, an older age and, uh, and then were admitted. So it can be an issue of timing for a lot of students in terms of, you know, we, we don't, um, we look at each application within the context of that time. So again, students who, who maybe if we're not recommending enrollment uh, are welcome to reapply at a later date. So this says do not, does not have a history of unrehabilitated behavior that poses a threat to themselves or others. So if there were some serious behavioral concerns at a younger age, but the student had a behavior plan and learned some skills and uh, were, you know, that history is not gonna be held against them. They can reapply and, and try again. Um, so frequently asked question, I think my student is a fit, but how much does it cost to st send a student to CSB? I often get this question at TVI, I'll say, oh, the district doesn't, you know, they're, oh, they're not going to like it. They don't want me to make a recommendation that's going to cost the district money. Um, or, and, and, or is there a cost for the family? We'll have families come and take a tour who will say, oh gosh, how much does all of this cost? So the answer to that frequently asked question is, that there is no cost to the family. We are a public school. 
um, there is a common misconception that we are an NPA or an NPS and or that we are a residential treatment facility since we have a residential component. And as we all know, uh, those of us who work in education, those are costly programs for districts. We are not an NPA, we're not an NPS, we're not a residential treatment facility. We are a public school that's run by the state of California. And so no cost to the parent minimal cost to the district. It, our residential placement costs approximately $15,000 a year for the district. That represents 10% of the unreimbursed costs for the residential program to the district. Now for day students, the cost of the district is the transportation to get the student to and from. Um, and I think Adrian made this slide and it's a big question mark because that tra daily transportation cost is going to range depending on where the school district is located. Um, and in some cases it might be as expensive as the residential program or in some cases it might even exceed the cost of our residential program. But in terms of um, districts placing out of district and paying for a placement, um, the, the cost is minimal compared to, to most out of district placements. And you might be asking when to refer a student to CSB. And we talked about that a little bit when I mentioned it might be an issue of timing. Um, so we'll talk about sort of in terms of student characteristics. Um, timing really depends on the individual student. Uh, we often receive referrals at transition points. Maybe the student is moving from elementary to middle school um, and, and the team has gotten together and, is, and feels like this is, this is the right time to go to CSB. There are often maturity issues and issues around separation from the family. Sometimes we'll hear from, from uh, districts, we're making this referral because we finally, you know, the, fa the family's finally ready to consider it. If it's a student who needs to access our residential program, um, that's a big deal for families and they need to be comfortable with that. Um, and part of that getting comfortable experience um, often comes with having experience with CSB and that might come through having students who have attended our short course or our summer academy program. Um, I saw Scott Smith here is here with us. He's our, our short course coordinator and um, he is great at working with me and letting me know if the family of a short course student is also considering enrollment. Um, we'll often tag team and, and um, I'll have the opportunity to observe that student and we'll try to facilitate that process for the, for the family. Sometimes it's the students themselves. Often, I think it's the students themselves who they attend a short course or summer academy, they come to CSB, they make some friends, and then they're advocating for themselves to their IEP teams that they would like to consider CSB as a, as a possible placement for them. Can I just say one thing in addition to that? You're really quiet, Scott. Oh, am I muted? No, I'm unmuted. No, you're just, your volume's really low. Oh. Um, if you can hear me now, the, uh, I think that uh, quite, quite a number of students that attend the short courses and the summer academy programs um, do so as an opportunity to try out the school and just and see what the experience of being on campus and being in the dorms is, uh, is like for, for them and to be able to, to give feedback to their families about, about that experience. So I think it's, it's a chance to, to try us out. Hey, Scott, there's a question in the chat about who's eligible for the summer program. Can you answer that? Can you um, just respond to that in the chat? Yeah, um, generally the summer program are for students nine years and, and older. And uh, we will um, be coming out with our list of courses, I think in about the next week or so. The different, this summer we're gonna, we're gonna have eight, uh, courses and uh, the age range for each individual course varies and there'll be some courses for younger students and some some for older students but generally that you know it's nine to about 19 or 20 years old that participate and uh, and the uh, the nice 
thing for um, because our our programs are online this year um, we ha tend to have a a greater variety of, of geography for students that participate. We'll have more students that'll participate from Southern California than, um, than our typical on-campus summer academies. So Scott, there's a couple other questions about the summer program in the chat. Can you write answers to um, those questions? And I'm gonna keep going because I think we're like way behind. I think we are, we did a little switcheroo on our screen sharing so we can let Shannon, our principal of uh, vocation transition programs, get to her class. Um, we'll continue this. Uh, we do recognize that everybody might have anticipated a 4.30 end. And if that is your case and you have a lingering question, put it in the chat and we will get back to you personally. Um, we're going to continue on our own end, realizing some of you are, are going to stay till the di to the very end, but also because we'll end up posting this on YouTube um, and it can be a resource. So we'll continue through. Um, if you do have a question and you have to leave, uh, make sure you put it out in the chat and one of us will try to personally respond back in the chat to connect with you. Okay, so um... Related to when, when to put in your referral, uh, people often ask, is there a deadline to submit an application? Um, and then they'll also ask, oh gosh, you know, we just got a blind student in our district. If we refer the student to CSB, does the student have to wait until the beginning of the school year to start? And the good news is, next slide. Who's doing the slides now? Adrian, is that you? Okay, thank you. Yes, the good news is that we have rolling admissions at CSB. We accept applications year round. There's no deadline to submit your application. Um, and we will work with referring teams and families to select an enrollment assessment start date that is best for the student. So if it's a student who is coming into one of our mainstream high school programs and is on diploma track, Ms. Martin will work with that team to sort of say, well, let's get you in before the, you know, at the semester break. Uh, you know, what makes sense for that student. Um, other students, we're just looking at ASAP, working with the families, getting that student in as soon as, as, soon as we can. Um, I will say that uh, we do start a lot of students right around the start of the school year. It's a nice natural transition time. But if you are referring a student for the start of the school year, uh, they're going to get an intake date that is not the first day of school and they need to be they need to have a program in their district they need to always start with a program in their district even if they're at a transition point we'll have folks who say well they're finishing elementary school and then they're going to come to you they don't even know anybody at the middle school and unfortunately they do need to, to be hooked up with a middle school program and part of the reason for that is because their their first 60 up to 60 days with us is an assessment period so as a safety net for the student if the student if it doesn't work out if the family decides that csb is not a match if the student decides it's not a match or if we do our assessment and decide that the student doesn't meet our eligibility criteria they need to have a program to go back to and we're technically in that assessment period working um, with the student on their district iep um, students can start an enrollment assessment up until the last 60 days of the school year, because we are looking at an assessment period, um, that's that's really our only limitation to the rolling admissions is, and, and we're coming right up on that. We have our, our last student is going to be joining us this year. Our last new student will be joining us this year, right around March 20th. And then any student, any applications that we receive pretty much now through the end of the school year, we're looking at um, a fall enrollment time for those students. Um, we do not bring, we do run extended school year, but we do not do enrollment assessments during extended school year. Um, the student school team wants to recommend CSB, but the family is skeptical. Can someone from the CSB admissions team attend our IEP meeting by phone or Zoom? Uh, the answer to that is unfortunately no, we cannot. Next slide, please. 
<laughs> CSB does not attend IEP meetings prior to admission, but I think we, I think what we will do with you is actually more effective, which is that we will meet with you or students or families to answer specific questions about our programs in the admissions process. And we've been doing a lot of this actually over Zoom during distance learning, where the family and the district rep is meeting with the principal and me, and we're really able to talk very specifically about the about the program and the students' needs. Um, and so I would encourage you if after you've read all of the admissions information on the website, if you still have questions or you wanted to arrange one of those meetings to contact the admissions office and we can we can work with you on that. And next slide. Um, and very, very much encouraged is to take a campus tour. It's highly re recommended that prospective students and their families tour CSB prior to applying. We've got a photo on this slide of two of our students. Uh, one of them's using her cane and one uh, and the other student is using his wheelchair and they are touring the campus. I mean, actually they're walking from place to place, but it looked like a nice photo for a tour. Um, sometimes we do have students assist with tours. Um, now, of course, right now, I, maybe you're asking in the chat, oh, can I come on a tour now? And unfortunately, no, you can't. Our campus is closed. But when we're in fully operational open doors, um, they, it's, it's highly encouraged that families and students come and check it out before you put, put uh, forth your application. Next slide. Um, get, getting down to the nitty gritty, how to refer a student to CSB. We'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, so the first step is that you're going to request an application packet from the admissions office. And distance learning has, has um, some silver linings. And one of them is that we have, um, we have been very flexible in terms of how you can receive and submit applications during this time. And we are moving uh, very quickly towards having an electric electronic application so that uh, the hope is in the very near future that you'll be able to just download the application and it it's a um, fillable PDF so you can fill it out. But for those of you who prefer pen and pencil, or if the family isn't tech savvy, you can also print it out and write on it. Um, either way, we're going to be really flexible and work with everybody um, on what's best for you to get this information back to us. We have been receiving applications completely through email. People will scan them and send them all as email attachments, and that's working just fine. So um, we're, we're willing to work with you um, during this kind of crazy distance learning time. Um, the application packet, it's, it's big, it's lengthy, it's time consuming. Um, I loved Gina's description of the process at the beginning. What did you say? It was kind of janky. <laughs> wonky? Wonky! It was wonky. wonky. I said a little wonky. Wonky, yes. Lengthy, uh, I think, is the word I was searching lengthy, for. Lengthy, yes. Lengthy for sure. There's a lot that we're asking you to send us. Uh, the current IEP, triennial assessments, uh, we, we want we need a vision report of some kind. Again, during distance learning, we've been very flexible with teams about how old that report can be. You know, we really have looked individually case by case to make this work for people. And, uh, and you need uh, approval from your administrator since there is a cost involved that, that the uh, school district supports the, the assessment uh, referral. Next slide. Once you uh, send us the application packet, uh, one of the, the frequently asked questions I did not include on here um, is um, if we receive an application packet from you and something is missing, like we didn't get the current IEP or an assessment report is missing or your administrator didn't sign off, you're going to hear back from us and we're going to be asking for those missing pieces. Um, once we get everything we need, then our admissions review committee, we meet weekly, we will review the application packet. We may or may not decide that ob observing the student in their current program is part of the information gathering process that we need to do. Um, if we've done both of those things, reviewed the application, observed if it was necessary, not observed if it wasn't, um, you, a, temporary, a temporary placement at CSB, that sort of enrollment assessment, that first 60 days we talked about, if that is offered as part of the enrollment assessment, then a medical packet is sent to the parent. 
And once we receive the completed medical packet, medical clearance for the student to be on campus, then an intake meeting is scheduled. And at that intake meeting, the family meets the assessment team, the assessment plan is assigned, and that begins the assessment of suitability for placement, which lasts up to 60 days. Um, I will say during distance learning, we have also been extremely flexible about the medical packets because we're not serving students in person, but it is a step in our process normally when we're on campus. Next slide. Frequently asked question. I just got a long letter from CSB in response to my student's application. It says my student is being offered an ASP. What does that mean? ASP stands for Assessment of Suitability for Placement, and this is something that is unique to the state special residential schools. I think I, most of us are familiar with a student moves into our district, the student's our student. There is no, you know, hey, are you a fit? Are you suitable? Uh, but state special schools does have this process. Once a completed application packet is received, all of our applicants are assessed for suitability of placement at CSB. Nobody enrolls right off the bat. This typically involves a temporary placement at CSB that can last up to 60 days. Uh, it does not always. Sometimes the assessment review committee will determine that the assessment for suitability for placement is going to happen in the student's current placement. Uh, for, for a variety of reasons, it's, it's determined that it's not in the student's best interest to bring them to campus for the assessment, but we're going to go, our assessment team's going to go to the student for the assessment instead. But most of the time the student comes to our campus as the most, as the best way to assess their fit for our program. And the assessment of suitability for placement is a comprehensive team assessment that takes place uh, with a full team, the classroom teacher, the TBI, the school psychologist, assistive technology specialist, orientation and mobility, and other appropriate related service providers are involved in the assessment. Um, and weekly reports are sent to the district and parents on progress for that assessment of suitability for placement. Try, try, we try to be fully transparent and keep people abreast of how the assessment is going. Now, I've heard Ms. Martin say that um, for the, from the student's perspective, uh, it's like they're, at, they're in school. They, and, and, and they are. It's like they're in school and it's time for their try. They're, they're, uh, once the intake is complete, they come in, they're participating in our programs. They're, it's an immersive assessment. Um, they are pulled by service providers just like they would be if they're having a try in district and the assessments are, being, are taking place. But a, the bulk of the assessment is really about come to school, try it out, be a student here, um, and let's see how it goes. Next slide. Um, the end of the assessment, it culminates in a meeting with the district and parents to make the final determination about whether or not CSB has an appropriate program for the student. If the student, if, if all team members are in agreement uh, for enrollment, then a new IEP is written to reflect the new placement and services and goals at CSB. Um, and um, this fine print, I'm not going to read it for you, but it basically is, is, is language from the Ed Code that, that um, states that the stay put is not CSB. So if there was disagreement at that point about the enrollment decision, the students stay put would be their district program that they had come from. Next slide. Couple more frequently asked questions and, and then we're, we're done with the admissions process. Um, frequently asked question, we just got a new student from Washington State who attended Washington School for the Blind. All IEP team members, including the parents have agreed to placement at CSB. Can we write this into the IEP? Student went to one state school for the blind, moved to California, another state school for the blind, why not? All students must apply and be assessed. So the IEP team um, can be in agreement about making a referral, uh, but the, the course of action for that IEP team is to document the agreement that they considered CSB on the continuum and they want to refer, and then to request an application packet. And we'll try to work as quickly as we can with you to uh, process that. Can parents make a referral to CSB? 
it's the school districts who need to make the referral. They're the ones who ultimately are going to have to cover the cost for the assessment. So they're the ones that make the referral. We do often get calls from parents who are interested in the school and um, we always encourage them to talk with their student's case manager and the IEP team about their interest in CSB and go from there. Um, I, I want to circle back to um, uh, Diane's comment from the very beginning. I don't even know if Diane is still with us. She maybe she had to go, but the um, I'm, I'm still here, Jennifer. Okay, great. You made that yeah. really interesting comment about you know <laughs> the checkbox on your IEP for that, yes. and, uh -huh. um, and I will often hear from parents, or we will have it written on the application when we'll say, well, why are you making a referral at this time? We will hear from parents that parents will say, I I never knew about the school until now. And so the fact, Diane, that you're pointing out that the IEP has those continuum options on it. Um, and if your IEP team is at, is always talking with the parent about this is the continuum of services, we could consider CSB, uh, you're doing the you're doing the absolute right thing of sort of discussing the whole continuum. Now the team may feel like there are uh, for that individual student that a placement at the state special schools would not be the least restrictive environment and you would talk about that and document it. But making sure that parents are aware of the state special schools as an option on the on that continuum is is absolutely the right thing to do. So we don't need to necessarily know if they're going to qualify or not. We just can talk about it like this is just another option. Yeah. Okay. Good to yeah. know. And, Thank and you. what we've heard from parents um, for years um, is that it's it's often not discussed and they're not aware that it's an option that exists. And once they found out, they sort of felt like, whoa, I wish I knew about this earlier. Um, so, okay, next slide. I think that's it. I think it's you now. Oh, okay, just some, just some contact information. I encourage you to visit our website. Um, there's all the information is there from the homepage. There's an admission tab that lists our criteria for admission. It has FAQs on there. It has the whole admissions process. And it, uh, and it also has contact information to request an application from our admissions office from Annie Turner. I wouldn't call her at this number because um, she's working from home most days like we all are, uh, but email is the best. And I think it's you now. Adrian. Yep, and we'll put all, we'll put the slide back into our YouTube description too. So if you're looking for a specific slide or something that you miss content on, email us, ask us in the chat right now, or we'll add it to the description as well. Um, uh, our educational outreach programs, uh, our mission is to provide consultation, assessment, training, and technical assistance throughout this state to educational teams. Um, and by educational team, we mean the full gamut, everybody, uh, from student to parent to all teachers and elements of that team. Uh, we do this specifically through a few of our departments. Our assistive technology center um, does assessments and instruction, as well as ways and methods and trainings to integrate and uh, teach best practices in using technology throughout the school day. Uh, we can do that uh, at site when we're when we are traveling. We're not traveling now, so we've really adopted um, an internet ready uh, outreach program where we partner with you, and we can either do Zoom calls or uh, whatever your district uses in terms of uh, web conferencing to come into your space the best we can and provide details. Um, the assessments we provide uh, aren't as technical in nature in the sense of we're not for typically will bring equipment and have your student trial it with you. Um, in this case, it's a little bit different, but you still get a lot of um, a lot of ideas uh, and places to go further with your students and what to try next. Our low vision services include a low vision clinic and a classroom. So we provide weekly on campus uh, low vision clinic exams in coordination with the UC Berkeley College of Optometry, typically on Wednesdays throughout the school year. Uh, we're excited and hopeful that that will come back next school year. That is something that got affected by the pandemic and the shutdown uh, this year. 
We also have a classroom that has a huge variety of video magnifiers. And then we also have the expertise of our low vision teacher specialist. And Vanessa can come out into your district and space and she can connect with you um, and make sure that you're taking into consideration the, the needs of your low vision students. Um, we then have an assessment center and we can do center-based and field-based assessments to students at all levels. I saw a lot of chat questions come up today about kids with multiple disabilities. And it's a hard, that's a hard answer because you might be thinking of a real specific definition of multiple disabilities and our different programs might meet different kids at different spaces and times. But our assessment center is truly built to be able to work with any student with a visual impairment um, and at, at, any, at any range, uh, any school age uh, level. And we can figure that out what works best, whether it's an assessment at our site where we have a family apartment and we encourage district team members and families to come to us, uh, or we can come to you and we can do a traveling assessment in the future. Um, right now during uh, our shutdown, we are doing a, uh, a, an interesting uh, middle ground of an assessment where we're doing an observation informational assessment where we're learning about your student learning about techniques uh, and strategies that you have implemented, making recommendations for further spaces to, uh, to trial and, and um, explore, and then following up with you to see how it's going. Our short-term programs uh, are divided into two spaces, our short courses, our week-long residential uh, programs, they can be day camps. They can also be online programming. Uh, this past year and a half, we've been doing only online programming, but uh, Scott Smith, who joined us a moment ago, as Scott and I are brainstorming, should we always have some form of an online program offered up? So that's definitely something we've been thinking about. Uh, we offer day camps. This particular picture is of Scott and a crew of kids uh, that were part of our horticulture uh, short course. And they built that planter box that some of them are standing within. So they got to learn how to use nails and hammer and screws and screwdriver. Um, and they learned the basics. They then filled that thing up and that planter actually sits right behind where they are against that wall um, and grows tomatoes and greens and herbs. Um, still, uh, it's still chugging away, even though it's been a little bit neglected. Um, but that camp was actually a two day day camp where they planted one day and then came back later in the year and harvested and, and cooked. Um, and then our short courses also are week long where kids come in and kind of act like a CSB student from Sunday through Friday. They stay on campus in the dorms, they get integrated into all of our social activities and opportunities. Uh, to be honest, we typically build out more fun uh, in their week than is necessarily an opportunity because we want to make sure they see art and they see PE and they see an activity after school. So we ensure that those things happen during a short course week. Um, and they stay and uh, just beautiful opportunities to socialize and gain independence. And sometimes all a student needs uh, from our school, uh, sometimes we can, we can take care of needs and we can supplement the great teaching you're doing in a district. We can supplement with short courses. It might not be that your student needs to come to CSB as a student full time. They can get little snippets and, and elements from our short course program um, and become their, their full self. Our other end of our short-term programs is our summer academies. Uh, so you all are seeing an actual list of our um, of our summer academies proposed titles. We have not uh, we have not gotten there yet, but typically they're week-long or longer residential programs that happen in the month of June. Um, this summer they will all be online programming. Um, we will not have anybody on campus. They're all going to be online. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a a large offering this summer to hopefully a wide variety of ages, and some of these you might see repeat. We have introduction to tabletop role-playing games. Um, oh, I would left D and D anyone in there? Uh, that it's a Dungeons and Dragons esque uh, experience, uh, and it's been one of our most popular events on campus and in short courses. We have a Come Cook With Us Academy, which is going to encourage our kids to become uh, chefs and take advantage of the skills they have. Um, and, and learn to cook. We have a camp called Tacos, Disasters, and My BFF, uh, personal storytelling inspired by NPR's The Moth Radio Hour. Kids are going to come together and learn to tell a story and be guided through that experience um, and do it collaboratively as well. We have a camp called The Amazing Race, which is an O&M and DLS adventure. 
who are teachers are just coming up with the coolest idea of ideas of how to make competition only motivating um, and how to make that competitive atmosphere uh, actualize in a really positive environment. We have a healthy habits course. Uh, still laughing, Scott, that we didn't rename that one. Uh, we always have to advertise to three groups. We have to advertise to educational team members to make you think it's worth it for your kid, to parents to make it think they want it. But we also have to advertise to the kids. Um, and we'll see which kids are jumping up and down about healthy habits. I think the title's going to change. But... Okay, beautiful. The, uh, we, it's going to teach them how, about fitness and eating, right? Um, and it's got some beautiful elements weaved in there, hopefully with a title that they won't balk at. Uh, road trip, destination, low vision, driving. Uh, talk about twisting my arm to convince us of doing a summer academy. Um, once we have this curriculum down packed and it looks fantastic. And we know it's a major, major milestone and moment that a lot of our low vision kids um, need to know. Uh, this, has, this ties into a lot of self-esteem uh, in those teenage years. And we've decided that we're going to venture into this space and try to try to help you all out with some of these questions that are very hard to answer for the right kid. Um, I'm ready, how to be prepared for an emergency uh, is, an, is a survival type uh, moment. It will be fun. This is not getting stuck in the woods. This is things like your cane broke. What do you do? Uh, you, you are in a situation you're uncomfortable with. What do you do? Um, and we'll also hopefully do some, some fun, exciting elements in that too. And then we're going to do a coding course uh, completely online. We're going to teach your kids how to do HTML code. Um, and what we don't have here, but what that will be paired with is a national coding symposium that we are co-hosting. Um, and so look out for notices. Uh, come May, there will be a coding symposium where we have a lot of cool blind uh, role models in the coding field and in technology. Um, and after that coding symposium will be an opportunity to sign up for the coding course. Um, and we'll make sure we keep a, a good chunk of that. Half of those reservations will be just for kids who attend uh, the coding symposium from California. Whew, we made it. Um, so this is our contact information of those of us who, who spoke today or on our administrative team. Um, I think you'll find when you reach out to us that our whole campus is available to answer your questions. Uh, we have this beautiful way of of having the ability and time to have expertise on our campus. We, everybody who works here just works with blind and low vision kids in a way that districts just couldn't possibly have the, uh, the ratios and the funding to support um, to this degree. So if you ask one of us a question, we will either answer it or provide you a person in our realm that's capable of that answer. And every once in a while you ask us a question, we have no clue what the answer is. Um, and we will tell you that and put our effort in and try to guide you or answer with you or figure it out. Um, we definitely have teams and the ability to put a little research into this partnership that we have with the state of California and educating our kids. Do we have another? There's another slide. Should I go to it? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Was this a placeholder? <laughs> Just I think kidding. We're done. <laughs> Any questions for anyone who's hung on? Thank you all for, for staying on. If you had a question, uh, you hung on this long, you might as well ask it. Um, I, I have a question. So um, a lot of information. So I just wanna be clear on the one thing. So you partner with other schools like Fremont. So if a student goes to CSB, then they would be attending their general ed classes at um, another school. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to be clear on that. So when I bring That's it up, not just the... a kid from Fremont, though we partner with Fremont Unified. So any right. kid, so they come in from San Diego, they could go to Fremont or Newark. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so they're splitting their day. Part of the day is on our campus, and part of the day is on the other campus. They drive back and forth between both schools with a teacher and an assistant. Um, and at both sites, we have resource rooms on those campuses as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I'm glad you're still here. Well, it was a lot of information. Yeah, that's why I'm here because we're, you know, we uh, have to put it on the IEP. I need to know what to say about the school. And so. And Adrian, could you good stop the slides so I can see oh, who's still here? Yes, sorry. Thank I you. 
<laughs> could have hung out there all Great. day. Thank you. No, well, I, I yeah. have a question. Sure. Okay. So I, I was wondering um, what the referral process is for the short courses and if there's any cost to the school district for that. Uh, Shai Scott is still here. There is never a cost to the school um, or the family for a short course, uh, especially when it's online, aside from the need to get internet access. Uh, during our summer academies in June, um, there is uh, we do have a struggle moment, uh, especially for you guys down south, um, where we have yet to find the avenue to provide any transportation. And so during our summer academies, we do ask that the family and the and or the school district work together to figure out a method to getting their students to our campus and getting picked up. Uh, we have seen some really creative ways that that's happened. We've seen districts with, we've seen districts support it. Uh, we've seen districts have uh, different types of um, agencies or affiliations that can support it as a sponsorship. Um, we've seen the Department of Rehab support kids uh, flying up or driving up to our campus. Okay. So we have. Uh, Scott can connect with you about those costs, but the actual cost, there is no bill. There is no cost to any of our outreach programs at all. Okay. Thank, thank you. I appreciate all the information today. Thank you. And then uh, as far as signing up uh, on our website, right on our homepage is a link to summer academies and short courses. We have not posted our summer academies, but short courses you can link. It's a Google form directly from our website. And if you ever have trouble with that, you can reach out to Scott Smith directly. Um, and he can walk you through an application. You have to scroll down, right, Adrian and Scott? Like you go to the home page, and you won't yeah. see it right away. Um, you, you scroll down a little bit, and there's a heading, short courses. Um, and then there's another heading, summer academies, at least for the moment. And uh, those headings are in this maroon uh, box, if you're looking visually. Otherwise, it's a heading for short courses on, online. And the good news for this year is you don't have those travel headaches. We do not have travel headaches. It's just about internet access. So, uh, and you know, we went through this last year too. That's not always easy, even though we've been no. doing distance learning for a long time. So districts have been creative with ways to support kids in our summer academies too. And we've seen districts be able to provide a space for a kid uh, for our program for a week. We've been seeing districts be able to provide a hotspot for a kid for a week. Um, to take advantage of, of these courses. So we're happy to try to troubleshoot and brainstorm those problems with you. 